Okay, great. Come back wow. did today. And Jack will give a talk about all minimality and uh, Hodge theory. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming again. So, yeah, I want to talk about some Hodge theory because I've been getting emails and emails. Please talk about Hodge theory. So I decided they will. Um, Hodge theory is a very natural domain uh, in which to apply O minimality, and in particular, the um, complex analytic definable theory, because it legitimately provides you with objects which are not algebraic. So you're not secretly just doing algebra, but they are, they do fall under this, under this purview. And there's all sorts of uh, fun applications you can derive. So let me start just by recalling um, how Hodge structures work and sort of the motivations for studying them. So I'll start with just the straight up definition. It can be a little bit intimidating at first, but we'll motivate it pretty quickly. So what we want, sorry, a hot structure is going to be a lattice over Z. So this is just a free abelian group. It would be a quadratic form Q on this group, and it would be a direct sum decomposition of the base chain to the complex numbers of this free abelian group into a bunch of complex vector spaces, which we'll term HPQ. There's some implied integer n here. So this is a Hodge structure Of weight n. I'll say stuff. I have an if coming up. I, I've got this, I think. If wow. some conditions coming up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not that easy. There's some stuff that has to be true. So I, I do want HPQ and HQP are conjugate. Okay, so that's the only like sort of closed condition. Um, and now we have a sort of inequality condition. So well, first of all, what is Q? Q is going to be either symmetric or skew-symmetric as a quadratic form, depending on the integer n. You shouldn't call it a quadratic form. Why? It is. Quadratic form is, is a symmetric form. Okay, by linear, by linear mapping, fair enough. Oof. Okay. Um, and the third condition is a positivity statement where it switches on the HPQs depending on whether on the parity of P or equivalent PQ. So if you look at I to the P minus Q, and you take sort of the, you flip it to get a Hermitian form. So you take Q of V and V bar, where V is an HP, sorry, then this is bigger than zero, where you take V to be a non-zero vector in HPQ. Okay? So this would define HPQ? This doesn't define HPQ, but you want this condition to be true whenever V is in HPQ. Yeah, so, HPQ. so HPQ is just part of the data. HPQ is just a vector space a vector. inside HC. Yeah, yeah, this is just a vector space decomposition. Absolutely. Other questions? All right, cool. So why, why this definition? <clears throat> what kind of object is this? It's, it's clearly a linear algebra object, right? There's no higher order stuff going on here. Uh, but it's sort of, it's a little bit complicated because you have many of these things, right? Already, once you're given a free abelian group, specifying a complex vector space decomposition is already a lot of information, right? Because if you take sort of automorphisms here, you just get Z automorphisms, whereas there's a whole sea of stuff to play with. So there's clearly a lot of data here. Can I make one more point? Please, please. So in the mean setup, this would be for a polarized. That's correct. Um, I can add the word polarized, absolutely. I mean, I'm not going to be considering unpolarized hot structures, but you're right. We want polarized hot structures. Absolutely. 
Please feel free to make as many <laughs> as many as you like. Um, OK, so why do we want this sort of structure? Uh, well, the primary motivation comes from algebraic geometry. So if we let x be a smooth projective variety over the complex numbers, right? <clears throat> then x, the cohomology of x, rather, have naturally this kind of structure occurring. So if we take n to be a positive integer, we can look at the nth cohomology of z, so modulo torsion. You can look at this kind of thing. And now, if we look at this tensor c, which will naturally be cohomology with complex coefficients, now we have many different ways to think of this group. One way is through the round cohomology. So you can think of it as the nth Durham cohomology group of x, so just closed forms, not exact forms. And because x is a holomorphic variety, you have a further decomposition right, for forms just by, act, by looking at how holomorphic you are in the tangent space, how holomorphic and how anti-holomorphic. And you have a double decomposition in this case. So this is. Well, with what? Uh, a, a manifold structure, you mean? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it naturally has one. But yes, absolutely. You have this natural kind of decomposition where P tells you how many dz's you have and Q tells you how many dz bars you have. Right? So these are not. Neither of these two, I mean, this one is easier maybe, but neither of these are obvious statements, but they are true in this context. <clears throat> so that gives us most of the data we want. We have this decomposition. And now, what is Q? Well, Q of alpha beta is just going to be the cup product. This will give you something in H to N. And if we go all the way to top cohomology, that's one dimensional. In fact, it's irreducible. How do we do that? Well, we're projective. So we have an O1 class. And so we can cup with the O1 class enough times, take its dimension x minus n. And this gives you a class in top cohomology, which is naturally an integer. So this gives you your form. So you have this pairing, which is just cup product in topological terms. If you want to think of this pairing on the Durham side, because these two are, you have the isomorphism, so a pairing here should be a pairing here, then over here is just wedge product. And then you wedge with the top guy, and you divide by the right constant, and it's the same thing. Absolutely. Alpha and beta are vectors inside here, which means the cohomology classes. So I'm allowed to cup them. Um, well, I want n to be at most dimension x. I'm sorry? What is the objection? Right, yeah, so n should be less than dimension. Right, right, right. So this works for n between 0, which is boring, and the dimension of x. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. OK. And so we have this very natural sort of invariant where we can take an algebraic variety, which is arguably a simple but a nonlinear object, and assign this kind of somewhat complicated but linear algebraic um, data to it. <clears throat> and that's why we care about, well, by and large, that's why we care about hot structures. This is the original motivation. So we don't need a primitive part that Yes, we do. God, I wrote in my notes that I always forget to put primitive. We do have to write primitive here. Sorry, you do want the primitive cohomology, which is some, something I don't want to go into. But yes. Let me give a simpler example now of what this kind of thing can be. Yes. So this is so the cohomology group of any manifold has a cup product, right? Sure. So n forms that live over here, 
If I think of them over here, they're just cohomology classes, and there's a well-defined cup product. After the lecture, maybe we can go into it in further details. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so what's a, a great example to keep in mind? A good example is if you take E to be an elliptic curve, and we take N to be 1, then the first cohomology group of E is just two-dimensional. So we have a two-dimensional group, cohomology group of E. And if we look at it uh, with complex coefficients, it naturally breaks up as H10 plus H01. And what are these? Well, you have an, a single holomorphic form on your elliptic curve. And that spans a one-dimensional vector space inside the cohomology. And it's conjugate that gives you the other one-dimensional vector space that gives you your decomposition. And the fun thing here is you can actually recover the full elliptic curve, the complex elliptic curve, from the Hodge structure in a very natural way. If you look at H1 of EC and you mod out by H1, 0, this gives you a one-dimensional vector space now, because it's 2 minus 1. And then you also mod out by the integer cohomology group. This gives you a complex vector space mod a lattice. So it's going to give you an elliptic curve. And this is exactly going to recover the elliptic curve you started with. OK, so this is very much not going to be true for more complicated varieties. You could do it for abelian varieties uh, as well. But more generally, you can't do this so easily. But at least it gives us a hint that um, the hard structure could be a very powerful invariant, enough to differentiate um, a lot of algebraic varieties. <clears throat> OK. So like many things, uh, <laughs> Hard structures are something which are very difficult to study one at a time and become much easier to think about in families. But before we move to families, let me just mention some uh, particularly interesting questions about hard structures, which are, of course, motivated by the Hodge conjecture. So if n is even, and we have a hard structure like there, we can ask for the integer Hodge classes which lie in a single HPQ, and that immediately forces them to be in the middle because the HPQs are conjugate to each other, and integer guys are self-conjugate. So if something lies in middle and is also integer, also in the, in the free abelian group, then we call these, I don't know what the name is, let's say the Hodge vectors or the Hodge classes. If, uh, yes, yes, yes. If n is even, I want n over 2 here. Thank you. Absolutely. And why are these things interesting? Well, because this immediately relates to the question of finding cycles inside algebraic varieties. So if you have y inside x as here, then you can look at the class of y. And this is going to be inside the 2 um, inside the two dimension y, um, I guess it depends how you do it. Um, let's just say this two dimension y uh, hard structure of x, so you can get something inside here. Co dimension, right. Thank you. Y is the co dimension of y inside here. And this is actually going to be a Hodge class because it's, it's patently integ integral. And if you work it out, it's represented by a form with equal holomorphic and the holomorphic parts. This is a Hodge class. Hodge vector. The what? So there's a way to get a cohomology class from the subvariety inside, inside x. And the Hodge conjecture. tells you that, in fact, all Hodge vectors are represented um, like this. All Hodge vectors look like this. <clears throat> uh, 
Okay, so you gotta add some rational coefficients, do some more work, but essentially this is what it says. Yeah, yes, you have to look like. I'm not gonna write the full thing. I never write complete statements, that way I can't get called on them. Um, okay, so still um, very open, and like I alluded to, the, the, what progress we do have essentially comes from looking at families. So it's very natural to try and get some definition for hot structures, which makes sense over some base instead of just one by one. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about that. <clears throat> so in order to think of these things uh, as families, it becomes very natural to make the following slight change. If we have a hard structure, H, Z, polarized hard structure, Q and this decomposition, you can replace the direct sum decomposition instead with a filtration, a descending filtration, where we define the pth piece of this filtration to just be the direct sum over p prime at least p of h p prime and the appropriate p prime. Okay, I always, <laughs> it took me a very long time to understand why might one might want to do this because direct sum decompositions are strictly nicer than filtration, at least in my opinion. Uh, so why would you possibly want to do this? Um, the reason, in retrospect, is quite natural. So if we are to make a definition of hard structures and families and study them, um, we want things to be algebraic or at least holomorphic. And the HPQs can't possibly be holomorphic and interesting because they're conjugate to each other. If you take any kind of holomorphic piece and you anti and you conjugate, you'll get something anti-holomorphic, right? And so it turns out that by making this filtration definition, you get something which will vary holomorphically and even algebraically in families. That's why, in my opinion, this is why you want to work with these with these filtration fine snaps. Okay, um, so if you want to work with families, it's very natural to consider the moduli space of these things. <clears throat> so now we have the following situation. We can let GR be the Grassmannian variety, it's an actual variety, of these filtrations, of these filtrations f dot h, once we fix h, z, and q. So fix only the integral information, fix the free abelian group, fix the pairing, and then ask, well, what are all the possible filtrations which come from hard structures like this? That's gonna be um, some Grossmannian thing. Except, for the positivity condition, this one over here, right? This positivity condition is the only way that this Q um, interacts with these FPs, essentially, except for some isotropicity stuff. <clears throat> and so inside of this Grassmannian, we're gonna have a semi-algebraic open set, D inside GR. It's a very nice open set, so it's a semi-algebraic open. corresponding to the positivity condition. The picture to keep in mind, for example, is uh, the upper half plane for this Grassmannian thing. If we look at the elliptic curve setup, just look at sort of Hodge filtrations here, it's enough to specify H10. That's just a complex line, so that's P1C. And then this D inside your P1C is going to be the upper half plane. In general, it's a more complicated Grassmannian. It's not going to be a Hermitian symmetric space. You won't have an additive structure, but it's still some Grassmannian. And inside it, you have some semi algebraic open set, all very explicit, all very clean. You don't want to tell us how you expect the possibility. Um, I can tell you. I don't know if I have a super illuminating way to think of it. You just recover the HPQs by intersecting these guys are conjugates and you write down the condition. I don't know if I have a, a smart way of thinking about it. 
What do you mean? Yes, yes, that's right, yeah. I don't know if you have to, but that's, yeah, I don't know of a, of a better thing to do, to understand the, the open set. When a question that's asked is uh, worth us hearing, please repeat it. Oh, yes, uh, the question was, is there, um, my interpretation is, is there a, an easy, a nice way to think of the positivity condition um, of this open set basically inside here? And my answer was basically, I don't have one. I think Nick does have one maybe, but uh, okay. <laughs> uh, my answer is just re-express the HPQs in terms of the filtration. I don't know why I'm talking louder all of a sudden. It feels like I have to reach way up there. Um, in my answer is you re-express the HPQs in terms of the filtration, you just, have the positivity condition. Yeah, I have nothing smart to say on the subject. I'm sorry? I, I still. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not sure I'm following what you're saying either. Yes. No, I haven't. That's right. Um, for a family, you mean? Right. Let me go on because I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm getting enough of this to, <laughs> to, to, to answer reasonably, and maybe if I say more stuff, we'll be more on the same page. Um, okay. <laughs> so we have this open set D inside uh, this Grassmannian. Um, and now, as usual, if we want to uh, give an actual moduli space in some kind, of, some kind of way, we have to account for automorphisms of our free, free abelian group. And so we let G be the automorphism group of this pair. Well, let me say H and Q, because I want to think of G as an algebraic group. <clears throat> so it's going to be some orthogonal or symplectic group, depending whether we're even or odd. <clears throat> and then, in a very natural sense, if we look at D mod GZ, this is a, whoops, moduli space of hard structures of this type. Of course, if I vary the Hodge numbers, I vary my h and my q, I'm going to get different moduli spaces, right? And again, in the elliptic curve setting, this is just the upper half plane mod s equals b. So we have these very natural um, complex manifolds, or orbifolds if you aren't careful, but that's not so important, uh, whose points correspond to isomorphism classes of these kinds of polarized hot structures. <clears throat> now, it's a theorem of many people, <clears throat> but notably Griffiths, and then there's a bunch of work sort of filling in more details, that most of the time this does not admit any algebraic structure. <clears throat> so D mod GZ is usually not algebraic. So what does this mean? You can phrase it in lots of different ways. Uh, they really mean this is a complex manifold and the strong sense in which this is not the complex point of any algebraic variety at all. Okay? Um, there are, of course, some cases uh, when it is, notably, Shimura varieties can be, this can be thought of in some in a natural way, generalization of Shimura varieties. Those are, of course, um, algebraic. But for more complicated Hodge structures, as the weight increases and the Hodge numbers become complicated, it's almost always um, not algebraic. <clears throat> However, you have the following situation. <clears throat> if you have a family, x over s, some algebraic family, so let's say this is a smooth projective family, where it is any kind of algebraic variety. So you could think of, for example, a family of hypersurfaces in Pn, or you can think of a family of elliptic curves over the modular curve or whatever. Then there's a natural map from this base S 
your modular space d mod gz, which just takes a point in the base, looks at the fiber, you get some algebraic variety, you can associate the appropriate high structures. Thought of as a hard structure here. <clears throat> okay? So you have this funny situation where you have this non algebraic complex manifold. Nonetheless, it has a lot of sort of algebraic data inside it. It has all of these maps from algebraic varieties um, inside it. And you can argue by sort of looking at Hilbert schemes, somehow like algebraic varieties come in countably many families, right? Essentially, you fix the, especially projective ones, you look at the projective space dimension, you fix some degree information that gives you a family, and you have countably many choices. And so inside most of these guys, you have these countably many algebraic families sort of sitting around that you want to understand because they all lie inside here, but this guy is not algebraic. <coughs> That's the state of events. That's how things look. <coughs> Okay, so the theorem, or the result I want to sort of talk a little bit about in some applications is that if you look at this D mod GZ, then this has a natural definable structure. So in fact, putting a definable structure here is, is the easy part. Here you can even give a natural RL definable structure. This is not surprising so far, right? Because if I tell you that the upper half plane mod SO to Z has a natural definable structure, that shouldn't surprise you because you could just draw a fundamental domain with circles and lines, and there's your definable structure right there. Circles and lines are algebraic. Just take one of those, put the natural definable structure on it, right? There's nothing to, to worry about there. The trick is we want to understand these maps. So if you look at these maps, these are called period maps. <clears throat> Has a naturally definable structure such that the period maps are also definable. They're not going to be definable over RL. That's way too much to expect. But they'll be definable over Rn exp. Always the same guy. Okay. I'm sorry? Oh, um, yes it is. <laughs> uh, this is due to, um, gosh, let me shift this over. This is due to um, Ben Baker, Bruno Klingler, and myself. <clears throat> okay, so, um, yeah, let me say a couple words about the proof, proof words, not even a sketch. But some words of the proof. So, um, what's happening here? So first, the definable structure, just to give you a sense of how this looks. Where is this coming from? Well, if you look at this D, we have our, we have our group G over here, this automorphism group. And it acts, its complex points act in our Grossmannian by moving around our filtration. But that's going to mess up the positivity condition, because the complex points don't care about your real structures. Uh, but the real points are not going to mess up the positivity condition. The way this looks is you have an action of the real points of your group on your D. This action is, in fact, transitive, you can show. And it identifies D with um, your group modulo some compact subgroup. Now, unlike in the setting of Shimura varieties, 
this is almost always not going to be a maximal compact subgroup. It will be some compact subgroup. <clears throat> OK, but so this can be carried out to the GZ quotient. You can identify it as a quotient on the right by a compact subgroup and on the left by GZ. Now, we want to do a similar thing to what we did uh, in the upper half plane, which is just take the usual fundamental domain and inherit the algebraic structure from that semi-algebraic set. And we can do that. Now we just take Ziegel sets here. So Ziegel sets essentially come from something like the NAK decomposition for semi-simple groups. And you can get a fundamental domain for your GZ action by sort of controlling the N and the A bits. It's an appropriate way. You essentially get some generalized version of these rectangles. Um, and if you take Ziegel sets and you transfer them over, over here, you get your semi-algebraic structure. <clears throat> so that's how this sort of looks. I know I'm skipping a lot of details that I don't really want to go into. But this part is not um, particularly deep. The, the tricky part uh, into which a lot goes into, not just our work, but as I'll explain, we use some really hard and uh, important classical work of Schmidt, is these period maps. So first of all, why do you need R and X? Why should you not expect it to be definable over R else? Well, let's examine what's happening in the case of elliptic curves. In the modular curve setup, you have your modular curve, and there's actually two natural RL structures on it. So let me do a little bit of an aside here. If I look at the modular curve Y1, the complex point, on the one hand, it's isomorphic to C via the J function, and C has got a natural algebraic structure on it, an algebraic variety. There's my structure. On the other hand, it's isomorphic to this fundamental domain in the upper half plane. And this is a semi-algebraic set in the upper half plane. So it gets a natural RL structure here as well. How do these two compare? Well, over here, what's a natural coordinate is just z. And over here, a natural coordinate is j. So for this, so the map actually, the period map goes from here over here. And so it's sort of J inverse. So we need J inverse to be definable. That's the same as J being definable. As we already saw, we need R and X for J. We need R n just because it's a power series. So we need something big enough to contain power series. And um, we need the X for the passage to infinity, the switch from the Z coordinate to the Q coordinate. I say we need R and X. Of course, we don't need all of R and X, but there are smaller structures that contain J, and that's sometimes important. But I'm explaining why it's sort of a natural place to look. Any questions about, about that? OK, so this is why you would expect to work inside RNXP. Now, the key thing to realize here is that period mass being definable is actually a local statement. What this is really about. is maps from polydisks, from punctured polydisks to G mod, D mod GZ. Because if I have this sort of period map uh, from, from my base, if my base is compact, there's nothing to check. Every holomorphic map on a compact set is definable on Rn. Because it's all power series, I can make them all overconvergent just by shrinking my open cover, and everything sort of checks out. All you got to worry about is what's happening at infinity. At infinity, everybody looks like this. Around every neighborhood of infinity, you can sort of take you can take guys like this. So the question, even though the result is going to be very interesting for algebraic varieties, the proof is really about these kind of maps. Now, as I think, Shao, you were saying, there are some maybe you were saying this as well, Nick. There, there are some differential conditions that are really important here. So it turns out that if you look at period maps that occur like this, these aren't just arbitrary holomorphic maps. They satisfy a differential equation called Griffith's transversality. <clears throat> so it's important to study this kind of maps satisfying a certain 
special differential equation that lives on d mod gz. I don't want to um, say too much about it. Um, I I'll just give a hint of what's happening. Essentially, if you look at a, a period map from an algebraic variety, and you want to understand its derivative, well, what's happening? What's happening is you have a filtration, and that filtration is slowly changing. So your FP starts bleeding over into the rest of the vector space. Now, what is your FP? It's the guys which have at least P holomorphic parts when thought of in terms of the Ram cohomology. It turns out that if I work out this change, I'm essentially differentiating a form like this. And all that can happen is my P can drop by one. But it can drop by more than one. So my FP, instead of bleeding over into the rest of the vector space, just blends over into FP minus one. OK, I'm not going to say more technical stuff about it, um, but it's an, important, it's an important condition which controls the asymptotics uh, of maps like this. If we didn't have this, we couldn't say very much. OK, now what do you need to know for this map to be definable? What does this really amount to in concrete terms? Well, it amounts to the following thing. So delta star to the m locally, you can think of as the upper half plane to the m mod z to the m. So I can think of this as a bunch of vertical strips, more or less. <coughs> um, and here I have my d mod gz. So I'm going to look at my cover of h to the m by this. And here I have a cover by d. And because these are simply connected, I can extend to a map like this. Now my d. As we saw last lecture, you can break it up into translates of these definable fundamental domains, just like the upper half plane can be tiled with fundamental domains. This thing I can break up into translates of vertical strips, call them vert, by integers, where I sort of bound the x coordinates. And the statement that this map is definable just amounts to saying that if I look inside one of these vertical strips and I look at its image, it's going to land inside finitely many of these fundamental domains. OK? It's not hard to see that that's necessary, because the map from vertical strip over here through there should be definable. And then you can get finiteness out of that in the usual sort of own minimal way. But in fact, it turns out to be equivalent. You just need to understand where a vertical strip goes. And so essentially, this amounts to understanding the asymptotics along this vertical strip so as you approach the boundary of these period maps. OK, so you have to understand these asymptotics. And Schmidt, um, in his seminal paper on Hodge variations, understood exactly this. He even phrased his, one of his theorems in terms of Siegel sets. And so Schmidt is exactly basically what you need in order to make this work. There's some additional argumentation, but he provides uh, the main input. <coughs> A uniformity? No, no, no. It's not look at one vertical strip and see where it goes. It'll follow for the rest of them. Because it looks the same on every vertical strip. If I translate the vertical strip here, it over here just amounts to acting by the monodromy action, because it's the, it's the, it's the covering. <clears throat> Great question. You do get it uniformly, but it's, not, it's nothing extra. OK, so that's a very brief sketch of the definability. <clears throat> so why would you be interested in something like this? Or what concretely can you get? out of it. So let me explain two applications. <clears throat> applications. So first of all, let's look at these maps. Suppose we have a period map like this. And let's say we're interested in the locus here where the corresponding Hodge structure has additional Hodge vectors, additional Hodge classes. So most of the time, you won't have any Hodge vectors if things are at least non-degenerate enough. <clears throat> Let's say you ask for when you expect more. So question, 
when does f does phi of s have additional Hodge vectors. Of, of little s. So I take a point inside big S and look at its image here. It corresponds to some Hodge structure. I want to know when I get an additional um, Hodge vector. <clears throat> OK, so uh, this locus is called the Hodge locus of s, or the Noether Lefschetz locus, lots of different names for it now. <clears throat> Now, what do we expect this to be? Well, if my period map came from a family of varieties like this, x over s, I'm asking for when there are certain subvarieties inside the fiber of a point over here, when x sub little s is additional algebraic subvarieties with some cohomological properties. Oh, oh, oh. Do you want subvarieties or do you want Hodge conjecture? Not Assuming the Hodge conjecture, absolutely. <laughs> so, assu no, I'm, I'm motivating, I'm motivating, I'm spitballing. Um, so, if the Hodge conjecture were true, We'd be looking for certain subvarieties and fibers. Those would be defined by algebraic conditions, right? So it's natural to guess the Hodge locus is in itself algebraic. Now you have to be careful because subvarieties come in countably many families, right? Stratify by degree and stuff. So it's natural to guess the Hodge locus is a countable union of algebraic subvarieties. That would be implied by the Hodge conjecture. This is in fact true unconditionally. It's a theorem of Catani, De Leon, Kaplan. That the Hodge locus is a countable union of algebraic subvarieties. OK, so the first thing I want to do is explain how one can get such a theorem very naturally from the definability of period maps. So, <clears throat> so here's a proof. This is a proof prime, so it's not the original proof. This is a different proof. I'll explain the original proof and how it connects. Yeah. Um, proof prime. So we want the points S here, whose image here has a certain property. So it's natural to just ask, well, what is the Hodge locus over here? Right? So step one. Is look at the Hodge locus of D mod GZ. What does this look like? Well, you can write it down quite simply. It's just linear algebra, right? Now we have our filtrations as before, but we insist that one particular vector lies inside the middle piece. So it's some linear algebraic condition. <clears throat> so this is naturally a union, a countable union of some things inside here. And what are those things? It turns out they're just semi-simple group orbits. In particular, they're all of the form some real group is some semi-simple group inside G is acting. And then if you mod out by GZ, you have this mod GZ here and mod some compact subgroup M sub H. So they're all of this form. They're all pretty simple to describe. And you can work out that all of these guys are definable. And again, this is very elementary. This is just working with, with Ziegel sets and some of their basic properties. There's nothing, nothing deep going on over here. <laughs> I'm sorry? The Lee and Katani Kaplan? No, no, no. This is a different proof. They, they did not use definability. I'll, I'll say what they did in a second. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let me write this as the union i goes from 1 to infinity of some sets k sub i. So what are k sub i? It's not algebraic, because it doesn't even make sense. There's no algebraic structure on d mod gz, but they're complex analytic, and they're definable. <clears throat> OK. But now, what's the Hodge locus here? The Hodge locus in s is just the inverse image of the Hodge locus in d mod gz which is the union of the inverse image of these k sub i's. Now, what is each of these guys? Well, still holomorphic, because the maps are holomorphic. Still definable, because the period maps are definable. These are definable holomorphic subsets 
but now they're in an algebraic variety. So the only definable holomorphic subsets in an algebraic variety are themselves algebraic. <coughs> so these are algebraic by Chow's theorem, by definable Chow. And that's the proof. There's nothing else to do. So once you have that this period map is definable, you get this funny situation where you have no algebraic structure over here, but you have these properties of being definable and holomorphic, which when you pull back to any algebraic variety, amount to algebraicity. And so now you can study all sorts of loci in D mod GZ, establish properties of them, and then pull them back to the algebraic setting where you can sort of reap a reward. <clears throat> Let me say a couple sentences about what Katarnid Lin Kaplan did. Um, their proof was in some sense not that different. It was just much, much more clever because they didn't have the ominimality. What they end up doing was they end up studying the Hodge locus and they study its behavior near infinity. Um, and they essentially prove that its closure in a compactification is still going to be holomorphic. And once you have that, then you can apply ordinary Gaga, ordinary Chow, essentially. So they also use Schmidt, right? They absolutely also use Schmidt. They actually use, they sort of use more because ominimality kind of packages all the analysis into it. Um, but so they have to use Schmidt and they have to use the SL2 to the N theorem um, uh, as well. So they, but absolutely, yeah, Schmidt, no one, no one replaced Schmidt. Schmidt's sort of the basic input to, to all these asymptotic questions. <clears throat> um, yeah, any questions about this? I can go until the five, right? Is that how it works? Okay, sounds good. So I wanted to say one more thing and then maybe some more stuff. Um, Schmidt's paper is very difficult. Um, I have still not digested it and nor have many people that I know. Uh, somehow he does some analysis on the group, which I don't know. I'd love, to, I'd love for someone to explain to me what he's actually doing. Yeah, Wolf Mm-hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so second application. Is um, the Griffiths conjecture. <clears throat> so made obviously um, by Griffiths. So which says, so this is a theorem of um, Baker uh, Johann Bruno Barb and myself, Bruno Barb and myself, though with a lot of prior work as well, again. Um, <clears throat> which says, suppose phi is a proper period map then the image of phi is algebraic. Okay, so a comment, first of all, what is this word proper doing here? Well, you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because even maps between algebraic varieties, if you don't have some properness condition, the image can be some constructible set that's not algebraic. So that's the only reason um, that's there. It just says extend your map as much as you can. It's a very natural thing to ask for with something like this. Um, and Secondly, what do we mean by the image is algebraic? Because again, D mod GZ doesn't have an algebraic structure. So you can say this a few different ways. You can say that the period map factors through an algebraic map, which then injects at the level of complex spaces into D mod GZ. But there's, enough, and there's a nicer way to say it. So if you look at the map from S to D mod GZ, and it's proper, then inside here you have some image phi of s. And now this is naturally a definable analytic space. And by definable chow, all such spaces, if they have an algebraic structure, have a unique algebraic structure. So unlike complex spaces where you have to worry, maybe you're putting the wrong one on, there's no such concern in the definable world. So this just says, you can interpret this as saying, this is not how Griffith thought about it, uh, of course. But you can interpret this as saying that there is an algebraic structure on the image compatible 
with the natural definable structure, definable analytic structure. Absolutely, yes, the first ways. <clears throat> okay, so why might you expect this to be true, and why is it surprising, potentially? So first, why it should be true. Okay. <clears throat> Suppose we have a period map like this. And let's look at the equivalence relation inside S cross S. Equivalence relation defined by phi, defined, uh, yeah, by our map phi. So I just uh, look at the set of pairs of points which have the same image. Okay. So it's, you can show it's analytic without much trouble, an analytic map. But in fact, this set over here, this corresponds to a Hodge locus. This is a component of the Hodge locus of S cross S. Now, what do I mean by the Hodge locus of S cross S? So which family of Hodge structures do I want? Well, if I have a hard structure on S and a hard structure on this other S, right? What I can do is I can tensor product them or look at HOM from one to the other, and there's a natural hard structure on that tensor product um, or that HOM. And then being the same hard structure means there's an isomorphism between them, and so that isomorphism will represent a Hodge vector. So it's not surprising that you sort of have this kind of story. <clears throat> and so this is algebraic. So it sort of feels like you should be done, right? It sort of feels, excuse me, it feels like you have a, a holomorphic map and the equivalence relation that map defines is algebraic. So you would expect an algebraic structure on the image. Remarkably, this is both false and hard to make true. Um, so it, it's very tantalizing for this. This really suggests the result is true. Um, it's kind of, it's incredible that there's no argument. <laughs> along these lines to actually prove it, but there, in fact, isn't one. Um, <clears throat> but it certainly motivates, motivates the result. Yeah, of course, if you had like a flat equivalence relation, then you would just have a quotient, and you would be done. Um, it's, it's very much not flat. Yeah, there's lots of natural conjecture, natural examples. Um, there's lots of examples coming from just moduli spaces, essentially. Uh, so we give several, like moduli spaces of. Oh, I wasn't in charge of this section. Um, <laughs> but if, <laughs> if you if you look at families of certain kind of subvarieties of Pn, uh, some specific Chow class, and you just look at that moduli space, and you look at the natural period map, then it's very much not obvious. In fact, it's not even obvious. The mod we prove using this method that the moduli space is quasi-projective. Um, so yeah. So also, um, I gotta admit, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would assume so, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> Other questions? Okay. So why is it surprising? Why surprising? I'll say something very brief about this. In something that's surprising, because what are these hard structures built out of? Right? They're built out of these filtrations, which are defined via the isomorphism between the RAM cohomology and integral cohomology. What's the isomorphism? It's just integration. RAM cohomology is built out of form classes. And to get a cohomology class, you just integrate them along cycles. Right, so this is built out, so the, the map phi is built out of period integrals. You take a holomorphic form, you integrate it along some cycle. Those give you a bunch of very transcendental functions, highly transcendental. 
In fact, there's an X annual for just these guys as well. You can see exactly how transcendental they are. They're as transcendental as you expect. Um, and then you package them together in some way, these filtration pieces, and you get these period maps. So it's kind of saying that this equivalence relation, which at its core is analytic, that's sort of how it's built, nonetheless, you can parameterize its fibers algebraically, which, I don't know, to me is a little surprising. It also explains why it's so hard to study the individual Hodge conjecture, for example. Or let's say you have like a period map on a curve, and you want to know when two points come together. I have a student, David Rubanik, who has many papers on this. Um, essentially, this is the hardest case. Because what does it mean for these two points to come together? It just means some period integrals happen to be sufficiently close, like agree or certain at least uh, polynomials in them agree. If that happens in a family, then you can do all sorts of stuff. But if it just happens for two points, it's extremely hard to say anything intelligible. <laughs> um, why don't I answer after the lectures because I'm running short on time? It's a great question. The, this exact notion of transcendence here is something very interesting. Um, OK, so let me just finish. Yeah. Let me just finish by giving an idea of, of how the proof works. The proof actually says forget about hard structures completely. This has nothing to do with hard structures. What you end up proving is the following very nice theorem. Suppose you have a map from x to y where this is algebraic, a complex algebraic thing, and this is definable analytic. And your map is proper. You don't need to assume proper, it's just nicer to say what happens when the map is proper. <coughs> Then the image is algebraic. In the proving this kind of result, which says we've already done our work with these, uh, with these uh, period maps, these moduli spaces, just by putting a definable analytic structure on them and showing these maps are definable. And then you can just work uh, and prove this kind of algebraicity theorem. Maybe also hinting, by the way, why this should approach doesn't work. Because somehow in the definable category, you can prove something like this. In the analytic category, this is extremely false, this kind of result. Why is this false, by the way? What is the easiest way to see it's false in the analytic category? What you can essentially do is just glue different points together. Take like uh, two complex lines and glue them along the integers downstairs. That's obviously not algebraic. And it's OK, so that might seem a little caricature-y, but, but this kind of phenomena is, is surprisingly hard to rule out. <clears throat> OK, and what's the idea of the, how do you approach something like this? <clears throat> this, by the way, is the whole reason why we developed um, the O minimal Gaga stuff and the theory of nilpotence, because the proof of this is essentially deformation theory. So the idea of the proof is you end up reducing to sort of a setting where x is w union z. This is closed. This is open. And you can show that phi of w and phi of z are algebraic. This is through like fairly standard like Hilbert scheme arguments. I'm running low on time. I can see more afterwards for those who are interested. And now the idea is you want to glue these two algebraic structures together. And how do you glue this together? Well, what you do is step one, you make thickenings of phi of z algebraic. You sort of reach out further and further into higher and higher order nilpotence. And then you glue using Artin's theorem. So Artin's work relating algebraic spaces and moisture zone spaces exactly met up with these kind of issues. And he developed this theory where if you can thicken along a closed, and then you can glue it to its open complement and get a global algebraic structure. So to do that in this setting, we can basically follow his template, but we have to understand these sort of maps, not just in reduced varieties, but on thickened ones as well. We have to do definable deformation theory, which is why, the, why I need that stuff. All right, let me end here. Thank you so much for your attention. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. Yes, you can. Uh, yeah, you can just you can remove the proper and get a constructible version. Yes. Well, the connection is. Let me just try to understand. The connection is definitely definable over um, over D mod GZ. It's still a part of the story. I just didn't want to. I just didn't focus on it. Um, so does it have. So do you mean? I'm not caught up on the language. Do you mean like given the variety? If you look at the like homology local system, you have a connection on it that's algebraic. Is that is that have an is that what you're sort of asking? Um, yeah, I'm saying it. Yeah. And then then I feel whether <laughs> I mean so if we interpret that connection to the local it's a differential connection. Yes. Now then we you, you can choose so I think you like this option. No. But do you like these differential equations? You do like these differential equations. So and, and is there some general construction of without yeah. Mm, well, here's here's something. In general, I'm scared of differential equations, um, so I don't know how to talk about even the, a general framework for your question. I, I personally understand it very well, but we studied the following kind of thing recently, where it's been understood much better um, in an upcoming paper of, of of Ben. So if you look at your Say you have a variety x, you have a base s, x, and you have a local system on it. Let's say a c local system on x. Now what you can do is you can look at the total space here, and there are two natural definable structures. One is just use the local system coordinates locally, and the other is use Riemann-Hilbert, so essentially solve the differential equation in some global way. And we show that for the ones that sort of behave nicely at infinity, including all these Picard Fuchs type things, these definable structures are the same. That's not true for arbitrary local systems. Like for example, last I think last class I gave a local system with this lambda monodromy, which is not true. But if you can avoid things like that, if you have like unipotent monodromy at infinity, or even if the eigenvalues are Rio is the good one, I think. Yes. I mean, there's this general notion that uh, linear differential equations are really the same as going to a flat point. Yes, yeah. So th those are good enough, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So regular single, regular single differential alone good enough? <sighs> like I don't point. know. I'd have to think. I'd have to remember what that means first of all, and then think about it. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. So then you're saying if you create one of your uh, solutions to a question, it's proving that those differential equations by themselves can be uh, minimal zeros? Absolutely. The that's, goes in. that's the point, yes. Mm -hmm. But the best work. No, that's not. It's. You can't really say that because if you have a fast-growing function, you can take its reciprocal and then add three, and that's also not definable. Um, so it's not really about growth, but it's related, of course. It's um, it's more about periodicity than growth, I would say. You can't. The problem with differential equations is that they grow too fast. They can't grow too fast to be definable. Um, <clears throat> it's more about this e to the x versus sine x difference, at least in the cases that come up. Um, yeah. I'm sorry? Right, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Questions from the sky? <laughs> from God. No, but thanks for a great talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.